Mr. Stewart, Mr. Mason, good morning. Nice to see you. Nice to see you all. Uh, before we start, just a couple of things. Um, firstly, uh, just so that you know, as far as the listing was concerned, this is listed for three hours. I understand that it might take longer than that, which is fine. My ladies and I can be available all day, obviously. Um, but uh, uh, you can cut your cloth according to that particular um, pocket. The other point is that we've obviously read the papers, read the extremely helpful um, skeletons, some of the authorities. So I think we have a lively appreciation of the issue that arises between you. Um, um, so you'll take that into account too when making your submissions. Um, other than that, over to you. Uh, Lord, I appear in this matter with Mr. MacDonald, my learned friend, Mr. 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 Council, appears for the respondent. My Lord, my ladies, if I have the courage of my conviction, I would open this entire sentence of business sit down, because there is a very short route to this appeal, and I shall give you those five sentences in a minute, and in my submission, those five sentences are unanswerable. Just in case... Uh, you would take the view that five sentences was even with my lordship's admonition and on the basis that all of you had read all the papers <coughs> a little bit short. I'm going to do uh, a slightly longer route, but it will still be pretty short. The gravamen of my submissions will be this is actually not a very difficult case. This is a case which is a paradigm example of that which the authorities have repeatedly said is not permitted, and indeed the statute, statute and the scheme says is not permitted, which is the re-adjudication of not substantially the same dispute, but the same dispute. And the short route to uh, the five sentences uh, are as follows. Sentence one. The matters on, in dispute on adjudication five before Mr. Curtis were relevantly all as to contractual responsibilities for delays in relation to the installation and, in, uh, and energization of the HV cables. Sentence <coughs> two, those matters in dispute were decided by Mr. Curtis substantially in favour of Sudrose in accordance with the requirements of paragraph 20 of the scheme at tab 13. And just to avoid looking at it um, again, if we could just look at the scheme in the authorities bundle, you have the scheme at the last page. And if you look at paragraph 20, you will see at page 201 the requirement on an adjudicator, in this case Mr. Curtis, in adjudication number five, <coughs> to decide the matters in dispute. And then over the page at paragraph 23, little two, the decision of the adjudicator shall be binding on the parties and they shall comply with it until the dispute is finally determined by legal proceedings, etc. Returning to my five sentences, sentence three, that decision was binding on the parties in accordance with section 108.3 of the Act, that's at tab 12, and paragraph 23.2 of the scheme, which you have just looked at. Sentence 4, Global Switch sought, illegitimately, to reopen the very same matters which had been decided against them in their defence to adjudication number 6. Sentence 5, this was correctly recognised by the adjudicator in paragraph 41 of his decision in adjudication number 6, but he was wrongly overruled by the judge. 
Just give me that paragraph reference. Parag paragraph, 20, paragraph 41 of adjudication number 6. But paragraph 41 of Mr. Malloy's decision. And paragraph 41 of Mr. Malloy's decision. Yeah. And, and, and just so that we can look at it, it is where at uh, page 309 of the bundle. It is clear that the issue of whether Sudlows was correct to refuse to connect and energise the HPV supply formed part of the dispute which Mr Curtis was required to decide. As such, it follows that Mr Curtis's finding that Sudlows was correct and that global switch is culpable for any delays that flow from that issue did form an essential uh, component of and basis for his decision. That being the case, it follows the parties are bound by Mr. Curtis's findings and reasons in this respect. And that, of course, was the basis upon which he then uh, proceeded. <coughs> it, it is worth pointing that, that that's the end of my five sentences. That's yeah. where I sit down if I have um, sufficient courage. Um, it, it is worth pointing out that what you have in this situation is now two adjudication decisions which are diametrically opposed. Adjudication number one, adjudication number five, Mr Curtis finding that contractual responsibility for substantially all of the delays, the installation and energisation of the HV cables were the responsibility of the employer, Global Switch. On the alternative position now enforced as a result of Mr Justice Waxman's decision, <coughs> precisely contrary findings in relation, not obviously to the entirety, but in particular in relation to energisation. And you therefore have two decisions of two adjudicators where absolutely the same materials tramped over coming to different conclusions. Now, what I propose to do now is just very briefly to show you why it is that I justify those five propositions, and in particular, to show why it is that the dispute which was determined in adjudication number five was only about contractual responsibility for the delays to installation and energisation. There is and never has been any dispute between the parties as to the consequence of those delays. And I'll, I'll show you that. In other words, the parties were agreed before Mr. Curtis and they were agreed before Mr. Malloy as to the fact that the problems with installation and the problems with energisation were the dominant causes of delay. No one has ever suggested otherwise. And in particular, it was never suggested otherwise before Mr Malloy. So the dispute between the parties has always been as to contractual responsibility. That was found in our favour by Mr Carter, Curtis and found in my learned friends favour by Mr um, Malloy. <coughs> now, to make that proposition good, can I first of all just remind you please of the, uh, what we say in uh, our skeleton argument at tab um, uh, 16, sorry, 17 of the main bundle. Without wishing to make too much of this, Mr Stewart, can I just say for my own part, um, and for the ears of those behind you, because I know it's not your fault, that finding the skeleton arguments uh, starting at page 429 of a bundle which kept collapsing when I tried to open it was not terribly helpful. Well, Melody, one of the first lessons I learned is that when you um, get to speak, you are actually responsible for everything, so um, I apologise for it. Um, it shouldn't have happened, I'm sorry. I, I hope you have at least
this now got here? Well, I've now moved it into another bundle yeah, that doesn't collapse. I was going to say, I have my own bundlet of the two skeletons and the judgment below, which has been a constant companion over the last <laughs> few years. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure your lordship has no difficulty in sleeping. Um, <laughs> My lord, my ladies, um, can I just respectfully, um, I'm not going to go through it, remind you uh, of what we identify as the matters um, which were in dispute in relation to Mr. Curtis's decision in subparagraph uh, 2A on page 2 of our skeleton. In essence, there were a series of relevant events about which we complained in relation to the cables. And the court will be aware of um, the general history, but in, in, in some way, what happened was that um, originally the HV works were meant to be done as enabling works before the contract. They weren't. They uh, were then uh, changed <coughs> in terms of how they were um, put in the ground. In essence, instead of being deep and straight, they were shallow and bendy. Um, that then led to problems in terms of the ductwork. The ductwork on our case caused damage to the cables which had been um, selected and put in. There was no doubt there was damage to the cables. We said it was down to the defective ductwork for which the employer was responsible. The um, cable was then changed to a different, more flexible cable. Um, we uh, then said that we were not um, happy to take responsibility for the energization of, of that cable. There was a Mexican standoff in relation to that, with the employer saying, you've got to, we're saying we're not. And those disputes in essence, formed the basis for Mr. Curtis's decision. And he found materially all of those disputes in our favor. Um, there was <coughs> an enormous amount of material which was put forward in relation to that dispute. And, and just to um, identify uh, some of that. If we could, if I could ask you please <coughs> to go to Mr. Curtis's decision, which is at tab 14 of the collapsing bundle, at, um, starting at page 206. You will see that after the parts in the uh, macro, which Mr. Curtis no doubt has, as to matters in dispute in adjudications, and you get to the part which consists of the evidence, that starts on page 220 of the bundle, and he identifies the witness statements put forward by Sudlows, the witness statement to Mr. McFarlane's for the respondents, the Sudlow's expert reports, which include Mr. Hudson and Mr. Marshall, Global's witness statements, Global's expert reports at 12.13, um, 12 and which include no less than three reports from Mr. Evan of Rena on page 222, and three reports from Mr. Payton of HKA on page 222. And all of that material was available to Mr. Curtis and was considered by him. If we then um, look at how he dealt with the history, very quickly, if we go please to 13.140 uh, on page 242, perhaps just start at 240, you'll see there's a head, heading, Sudlow's unsuccessful attempts to install the HVB cables. 
And he goes through the history in relation with that, and his conclusions are at 13.140, which is that we, the contractor, didn't fully comply with the standards for pulling the cables, but he, on balance, agreed that our cable pulling methodology was nevertheless adequate, and that he deals with the consequences later on. <coughs> Similarly, if you go through to paragraph 13.185 at uh, page uh, 248, you'll see that after a lengthy section, he concludes that the duct work for which the employer was responsible was defective and not fit for purpose, and that the employer was responsible for delays resulting from their defective duct work. Uh, 13.215 on page 251, you'll see that the um, cable selection was changed by the employer, and at 13.255, uh, sorry, 13.225 at page 253, uh, he agrees with Sublows as to the reasons for that change. At 13.229, <coughs> sorry, agrees with Sublows as to the reason for the change, which was. Um, essentially that it would have been designed to change the specification in order to have a more flexible um, cable which could go round corners more easily. That's, that's a short summary. Of I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then 13.229, and this is a very important conclusion, he finds that the cause of damage to the HV cables primary cause was Global's defective duct work. They were responsible for the defective duct network and hence liable for any resultant delays to the completion date. That's 13.229 on page uh, 254. At 13.281 on page um, 259, um, he, he's, he's got the story through, and we'll see in a minute that the story in this context means the story through until well, August of 2020, to the point at which um, the HV cables has been installed, uh, and uh, there's now uh, the requirement to terminate and energise it. And so 13.281 is the beginning of the, per the passage which I referred to just now as the Mexican standoff. <coughs> Uh, and um, you'll see that in this context, he sets out the arguments, uh, and he, at 13.283, identifies that Global's position was that they denied their works were defective, etc., etc. They didn't agree with the contentions they were being unfairly asked to take responsibility for the cable. And you'll see at 13.284, that their position was supported by the expert reports of Mr. Payton, of HKA, and the three reports which I showed you from Mr. Evans of RENA. And um, his conclusion at 13.289 was that Sudlows were correct, we were entitled to refuse to connect and energise the HV supply, Global were comfortable for any delays that flowed from the issue, and we were therefore entitled to an AAT for any delays that occurred, uh, that must be to the completion date. And that, in summary, was his determination based on the evidence you've seen in relation to the points. Now, I should tell you that earlier on in the story, and this isn't relevant to anything you have to decide, but earlier on in the story, there were some disputes about availability and the effect on the works of the HV cable. In some minor respects, he found in favour of um, he found in favour of the employer in those earlier periods, but that's got nothing to do, and that, that's why, in essence, we don't get a full extension of time up to the 18th of January. We only get an extension up of time up until December of 2020, because earlier on there had been some delays for which we bore con contractual responsibility. But in is it December? There was a date of the 4th of January. I 
schools. There's, there's, a, there's a different date for section two and 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 um, and the completion of the works as a whole. But, the, but okay. But, but we're talking about window twenty nine. Yes. The claim and extension was down to the eighteenth of January. Yes. And the granted extension by Mr. Curtis in adjudication five was down to. Uh, the, well, it depends whether it's section two or, or, or until uh, the end of the works. But for, uh, your lordship, right, for the whole of the works, it's until I think two weeks before or thereabouts. But the reason okay. for that is that is not actually in in, in window twenty nine. It's because we haven't got a full extension earlier on. Okay. So 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 uh, on a, a full extension is granted effectively for the by Mr. Curtis in relation to the all of the arguments about the defective duct work, yes. but um, that's not a full extension of time overall because there was a prior period for which we bore some responsibility. You, you bore some responsibility. I'll just make a note of that. And that, and how is that reflected just in date? Well, can I, can I, I'm going directly to that. The okay. easiest way to look at it, my Lord, is actually to, um, there's, a, there's a table which he sets out the rival position of the delay analysis, and you see that at page 268. And what we've got here is a, a table yeah. which has got Mr. Hudson's analysis. Mr. Hudson was our expert. Mr. Bayer, Mr. Ball was their expert. And what we're talking about in this case here is not the delays in relation to the enabling works, which are in on Mr. Hudson's analysis, Windows 14, 15, and 16, but we are talking about um, uh, delays to the cable installation progress and the defective cable, which start in June of 2019, and they go right the way through until the 18th of January at the end. Now, the important purpose for present purposes is that although these look as if they are slightly different, um, in reality, as Mr. Curtis explains, the parties are not actually disputing what the causes were. There are some muddling around the edges, and in particular, if you look at um, window 29, that is divided into two mm. by Mr. Baal, um, but the, 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 the differences are immaterial for present purposes, and you see this. Um, the primary difference between the experts is their opinion of the cause of the delays, that's 14.39. And what they are really doing is taking account of the possibility that some of the relevant events which have been subject to the earlier decisions had gone there, had gone different ways. But if you look at Mr. Barl's analysis, he starts saying that from the beginning of Windows 17, the problem is HVB cable installation progress. And he says that running from 28th of June 2019, right the way through until the 7th of August. The problem is the defective HVB cable. Mr. Hudson divides that up separately. He says that there were some additional requirements <coughs> which were imposed by the employer, which are the RFS, RFC requirements, then defective enabling works. And the reason for that difference is that He's saying it's the defective enabling works which cause the problem with the cables. <laughs> so it's, it's really the same, same matter. Then he puts down defective enabling works and non-compliant HVB cables. And, and the, the 7th of August date is the date at which the Mexican standoff starts. And Mr. Barl says partial permission permit to work and request for instruction for derogation of power. But, but if one looks at what is being said here, one sees that this is, as the adjudicator finds, um, uh, all about the um, uh, 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 about contractual responsibility, and one sees that um, first of all, if you look at thirteen point two nine one at page two six one.
it is common ground between the parties that the dominant cause of the delays to practical completion of the Section 2 works has been the issues covered in the previous section regarding the termination and energisation and testing of the HV uh, supply system. Uh, and that is saying that um, once you've determined who's responsible for the Mexican standoff, both parties agree that that's the cause of delays to completion. Uh, and if you look at the discussion in relation to um, 14.108, uh, 14 Could we start? I'm sorry, at page 276. Yeah. This is considering 14.93 Windows 22 to 28, which is from the 31st of October 2019 to 29th of May. Uh, and you see the adjudicator recording correctly. During this period, Hudson considered that 144 days of critical delay was incurred due to defective enabling containment works. The critically delayed activity was the HV live testing. This was the same activity that Hudson considered was critically earlier in Windows 18 to 51. And then Baal, during this period, considered the same period, was incurred attributable to the defective and unrectified HVV cable supply. Uh, they agree that the critical activity was HV live testing. Agree, Hudlow is considered the defective HV cabling was the cause of delay. Uh, and then at 14.102, for the purposes of analysing delays, it appears that Mr. Hudson and Mr. Barr agree the same delay event was the cause of delay uh, during this period. And his conclusion, 14.105, the global are, are culpable for the delay events covered in this window. Sudlows are therefore entitled to an EOT and therefore 144 days is awarded. And then in relation to Windows 29, where you see um, the analysis being divided between 29A and B, the adjudicator goes through and explains um, how the windows have been divided up. But the critical points are in 14.118, where there's agreement that the critical delayed activity was the HV live testing. That's the same as before. Um, then he says Mr. Barl has broken down the window into 29A and 29B, uh, and you see how that is then done. Um, and his conclusion, 14.126, have already concluded that Globals will cover the delay events and Sudlers are therefore entitled to the EAT. Both Hudson and Bell do the day delays total 234 days. And, and so although, as it were, conventionally, you, you've got all of this, once you've decided, as Mr. Um, Curtis did, that these delay events in this window were all the responsibility of the employer, then there is no difference at all between the parties as to what the consequences of that are. Yeah. And my Lord, just to make the obvious point, if you are therefore describing what is or what was the dispute between the parties which Mr. Curtis decided, it was not um, the amount of any delay. That wasn't in dispute. What he decided was the responsibility for the events, the delays to the cable or its non energization and he decided that in my client's favour. <coughs> um, now, what then was sought to be done by Global in um, the defence to, sorry, I should back up a little bit. This decision came out in um, May of 2021. Yeah. And, and therefore, 
Um, the contract administrator, who'd been solidly on the side of the employer, knew that the adjudicator had decided where the contractual responsibility for the energisation was. The energisation was taken out of the scope of my client's work, and that then led to practical completion. No one ever suggested that there was any different or other cause of delay between the 18th of January and thereafter. Everyone accepted at all times that it was energisation which was the problem. And, and therefore looking, as it were, as to what ought to have happened, there is no doubt at all that the employer, and for that matter, the contract administrator, um, were saying loudly and to anyone who would listen that Mr Curtis was quite wrong, that it was an outrage, and that my clients had got away with blue murder. But plainly, that decision was then made, and what ought to have happened is that any competent contract administrator would say, well, that point's now been determined, it follows that they're entitled to a further extension up until practical completion. We are going to protest about that. We're going to issue proceedings to go to the PCC, which, as the court knows, has in fact been done. And in that, we will have a full and proper opportunity on their case to put right the monstrous injustice which has occurred. Plainly, as the court will appreciate, we don't accept any of that, but that's, that's what their rights and obligations are. Instead of doing that, and rather remarkably, uh, and sorry, th then of course um, we've got practical completion, we've got the process of putting in a further in, um, interim uh, valuation to take apart, apart from the else of um, uh, retention and so forth. <clears throat> that plainly should have been valued upon the basis of the decision which had been made by the adjudicator, no doubt under protest. Uh, there would, because as you would have seen, these parties don't actually necessarily see eye to eye on every aspect of this dispute, have mm -hmm. been um, an adjudication before uh, Mr Malloy, but it should never have involved the question of delays too. It should have involved the questions which were outstanding, which hadn't been decided, which in essence were uh, matters relating to Section 1 and also valuations of individual items of work and so forth, which were the subject of the matter. And we would then no doubt be in the position we are actually in, of going to the TCC, that we wouldn't have had the refight in relation to um, Section 2. Now, just to make it plain um, that they were completely refighting that which they had already lost. Can I show you um, a couple of documents? The first is in their response to uh, adjudication uh, number six, which is found in the supplementary bundle at page 50. This is, this is the um, response in adjudication number five. Um, so this is the one we've been looking at the decision of. It's in tab eight. But just to identify what they were complaining about, if you go to paragraph 123 on page uh, 54, you'll see them complaining in this response about all the matters which you've now seen were determined against them uh, in paragraphs 123 to 123.6. And 
if you then look at um, the uh, response, the equivalent response in uh, adjudication number six, you have that at tab 19. <clears throat> and if you go to page 218, see at paragraph 74, the adjudication 5 documents to which Global Switch intends to refer in the response including the following, and then they identify the witness statement of Mr. Goodwin, the first and second expert reports of Mr. Marshall, the response uh, which we just looked at, and accompanying documents including without limitation the witness statements, first expert reports, the first expert reports of Rena, the reply, uh, the rejoinder, and so forth. And if you go to 75, you'll see that at 220, they say brazenly, where relevant to the extension of time sought by Sudlow's global switch summarizes and where relevant updates its submissions and evidence in adjudication 5 at paragraphs 420 to 555, 54 below. And if you go to page 225, <coughs> you'll see that they're quite brazen about saying that Mr. Curtis got the matters wrong. By way of contacts, they sought an adjudication of 509 days. We were awarded 482 days. Um, Sudlow should not have been awarded 481 days of the 482 day extension. They generously accept we'd have been entitled to one day of delay. Had the adjudicator, Mr. Curtis, correctly analyzed the factual and technical evidence, he would have reached the decision that Sudlow's was not so entitled. This will become apparent for the reasons discussed below. For the purposes, they accept that notwithstanding the obvious, serious, and fundamental flaws, the adjudicator is bound by the decision to award an extension of time of 428, 480 days from Windows uh, <coughs> 29 only. A a and then they then set out at paragraphs 424. Oh, hang on, I'm just noting something else. Yeah, so are you taking us to 424 mile old at 228? And they go back and they completely rehash. In relation to the installation of the replacement HVB cable, there can be no relevant event for the purposes of clause 2.26.6. The reasons set out, Sudlow's had no justification and therefore in default for refusing to facilitate the termination, connection, testing and analysisation. The issues it raised was installed were invented, unsupported by any needful analysis, not borne out by the evidence, etc. So they are nakedly saying we want to have a second bite at this particular cherry. And the so-called new evidence was merely saying, after we'd taken the works out, we managed successfully to energize the cables. Rena had already been saying that they were right about it. It wasn't in any way arising out of new events or anything like that. The question was not, um, as it were, what would uh, happen in the future. The question was just the responsibility for the system. And, and one, one can test it in this way. S suppose that the matter had been decided against us. Suppose it had been found that it was our responsibility to energise the cables and the delays were our responsibility. Now, we would no doubt, in fact, I'm say with confidence, that we would have challenged that and we'd have been on the other side in the TCC looking at that. But we could not possibly 
have gone back to the adjudicator and said, do you know, we tried to do this and it com was failed completely because of matters for which you were responsible and therefore we'd like, please, to have an extension of time in relation to that relevant event from the 18th of January 2016 until whenever it was that it took place. <coughs> Um, and and in, in, in my submission, that is all you need to determine this appeal. Now, I, I am, having done that, going to, um, if I may, spend no more than a few minutes identifying what I said was the longer route. Because in, in my submission, Serial adjudications and the problems which they have given rise to <coughs> are not a new issue. And I will make some suggestions as to why it is that although on a proper analysis of the law, the position is perfectly plain, it is still capable of being misunderstood, not only by all people who have to administer contracts, but even, dare I say it, by experienced TCC judges. And the, the heart of my suggestion will be that um, the courts have not fully recognised and analysed the difference or the differences in the way dispute is used. They haven't fully recognised and analysed the way decision is used, and they haven't fully recognised and considered the difference between the um, provision which was at the heart of the first Court of Appeal um, decision in this area, which is when an adjudicator is required to resign, and the other requirement in the rules, which is that a decision is final unless and until it is set aside in litigation or arbitration. And it is, I would suggest, for those reasons that Mr Justice Waxman, although an extremely experienced, um, of course, judge, went wrong in this case. <clears throat> now, for at least one member of the court, um, and, and possibly all three, I, I'm going to spend about a minute and a half um, teaching how to suck uh, eggs. No, I, yeah, I, I don't, you mustn't assume any knowledge on the, certainly you can in relation to my ladies, but you can't in relation to me because um, uh, I have not, in the time that I've been in this court, I've not, not only have I not decided a can the second adjudicator decide this point as a result of the decision in the first adjudication, but um, I'm not conscious that I've seen any of the cases. So um, don't neither of you must feel that, that, well, I'm sure he knows that, because the chances are I don't. As I say, that's, that's speaking personally, my ladies probably do, but I, I'm afraid there's, there's quite a lot that's new um, um, and I'm sure you'll get to it, but uh, in particular, the uh, decision of Mr. Justice Stuart Smith, as he then was in Hitachi, which um, in which he um, drew the distinction between dispute and decision, <coughs> uh, uh, and. Um, Speaking entirely for myself, I, I thought a lot of his analysis was extremely helpful. Well, I'm, I'm definitely going to come to it, actually. Fine. Um, I, I'm going to spend two minutes um, sucking eggs, and then I'm going to do a little bit um, of, of, of rather more detailed work. The sucking eggs is um, simply this. Um, as all members of this court know, at common law, uh, building contracts were entire contracts, and builders got paid in the absence of special provisions when they had substantially completed the works. From at least the early 19th century, one of the contribution of either English law or the people who administered contracts 
was to introduce uh, contract forms which contained two things. One was provision for interim payment, so that you got paid as you went along. And the second, in some form or another, was a contract administrator who obviously had uh, roles according to the uh, contract, but was often required to act in what was sometimes referred to as a quasi-arbitral or judicial uh, that it was obliged to act fairly in deciding what entitlement the um, contractor had. And that system was exported to a large number of other countries around the world. By the 1990s, there were um, enormous concerns about cost and delay of litigation and arbitration, cash flow in the construction industry, and a range of other matters. And that led to statutory intervention, and in particular to the relevant provisions of the um, Housing Grants Construction and Regeneration Act and the statutory scheme. That statutory scheme is and always has been um, designed to achieve two things. One is to reduce cost and delay, and the second is to achieve early temporary resolution of disputes. And that that is so is apparent from uh, three uh, citations which I proposed to show or remind the court of. The first is paragraph two of Lord Justice May's um, uh, decision in Quiet Hill, which, um, judgment in Quiet Hill, which is tab two of the authorities bundle, where he reminds the court of Mr. Justice Dyson's decision, seminal decision in Maycob, one of the very early decisions about adjudications, uh, and Lord Justice May pithily says, in short, adjudication is intended to provide a speedy and proportionate temporary decision of disputes arising under construction contracts. The idea includes that such a decision may hold the ring for the moment in a fair way and help the parties, if possible, to resolve their disputes finally by agreement without the need for protracted and often very expensive arbitration or litigation. Following on from that, um, I'm tempted to say when Noah, Noah was a boy, but it might be um, um, misconstrued, is a decision uh, of um, a gentleman called Mr. Justice Coulson, as he then was, uh, which is in Benfield. Uh, and uh, this decision, as we've now moved forward some nine years from uh, Maycob, uh, and if one looks at uh, what you said, my lord, uh, at uh, paragraph 57, on page um, 39, under conclusions, adjudication is supposed to be a quick one-off event. It shouldn't be allowed to become a process by which a series of decisions by different people can be sought every time a new issue or a new way of putting a case occurs to one or other of contracting parties. Given the clear results of the dispute as to practical completion of liquidated damages following adjudications one and two, the claimant ought not to have commenced the third adjudication. If, as it obviously was, the claimant was unhappy with the results of adjudications one and two, then the claimant should have gone either to an arbitrator or to the court in order to challenge those decisions. Uh, and then following on from that, um, some three years later, there is a decision of Mr Justice Aikenhead in Carillion and Smith, which is at the um, next um, uh, tab of the authorities <coughs> bundle, uh, he um, starts to deal with the uh, law at um, paragraph 46 on page 64. He agrees with you at Paragraph 49, not the passage I've just read out, but uh, an, uh, an earlier passage um, at 49 on page 67. Uh, and then, um, in relation to uh, this, if one can go forward, please, to page 68. <coughs> 
This is a passage which is discussed by Mr. Justice Stuart Smith. Yes. A and the passage which is being discussed starts at 54, and I'm going to come back to it in the context of what Mr. Justice Stuart Smith says. But for present purposes, I'm on a slightly different point, which is at 55. When one is comparing disputes referred to adjudication and successive adjudication, one needs to look at the substance and essence of each dispute which has been referred. Each party to a contract which contains an adjudication agreement, either expressly or by statutory incorporation, has a right to expect that it can have any given dispute referred to and resolved by adjudication. It has no right to expect that it can have essentially the same dispute referred to adjudication more than once. Apart from the authorities supporting this proposition, primarily the Quietfield and Benfield construction cases, the logic is obvious in commercial terms. Serial or repeat adjudication <coughs> on what is essentially the same dispute can cost an enormous amount of money, time and management resource, and can be used as a tactical weapon which was never intended when the Housing Grants Construction Regeneration Act came into force. It's not as if the party which has failed on an earlier adjudication has no remedy. Generally, it will have a remedy, usually of arbitration or litigation, to secure a final resolution of its dispute. Uh, and then he goes on to bear in mind the costs. Now, the reason I've started that by way of introduction is that in my submission, <coughs> each of those three statements, in slightly different ways, are A, plainly obviously correct, B, plainly in accordance with the statutory purpose, and three, made a mockery of if my learned friend's contentions are right. Because what he is saying, as I understand it, is that despite the enormous time and effort which was went, went to, and despite the fact that no one is suggesting that the court could possibly reach a different decision in relation to the allocation of liability for delays in relation to the period up to the 18th of January and the period after the 18th of January. In other words, there's no suggestion of any different or alternative um, cause of delay. Nonetheless, his clients were fully entitled to re-argue the entire matter at very substantial expense. And that when it then came to enforcement, sorry, secondly, that not only was Mr. Malloy entitled to reopen it, but he was obliged to reopen it. In other words, it would be a failure of natural justice not to allow Global Switch to rerun precisely the same arguments as they've been put before. Now, I, I make no bones about it, my lord and my ladies. If that is the case, it is directly contrary to the statutory purpose which has been identified in the decisions I've shown you. Um, it is common ground between the parties, as I understand it, and there are numerous references in the authorities that um, the initial focus should be on what the adjudicator in a particular adjudication actually decided. What we say about that is that means the reality of his decision. Let's give some practical examples. <clears throat> uh, sorry, just before I give the examples. My learned friend, as I understand it, says it all depends on the precise form of the relief granted. I, I think he says, although he'll no doubt make it plain, he certainly said below, that if there had been a de declaration here by Mr. Curtis that um, his clients, Global Switch, were responsible from, for delays resulting from relevant events or from energisation, he would be bound by it. But he says it's all the difference because one's looking at a different period, even though he fully accepts, as he has to, that there is no logical reason at all for a difference 
to the period before and after the 18th of January. Now, not only is that a logical nonsense, but it is, in my submission, inconsistent with the authorities. And, and we'll look at it in a minute for a, a good example of Mr. Justice Stuart Smith's decision. But b before we do that, can I just give some examples? Yeah. Suppose you have a situation where there is um, a dispute between the parties as to whether or not a party is entitled to an extension of time. And let's deal, first of all, with a situation where the extension of time is granted. As, as I understand it, it is common ground that to the extent that the extension of time is granted, then absent presumably some very unusual um, contractual provisions, that is a final extension. <clears throat> Sorry, that, that's an extension which has to be granted. But suppose it's the case that um, there's an ongoing delay. And the only reason for an extension being to a particular date is that's the only date that has been reached. Contra contrast that with a situation where the um, adjudicator gives the same extension of time but says that he's satisfied that the total delay is 50 days. In other words, he gives the same extension of time but in his reasoning he makes it plain that one's the total, the other one's ongoing. In Maloney Friend's case you would get precisely the same determination but you would be entitled in the second case to go back and say, although he only gave 50 days, and although it was plain that he considered all the matters and that was all he was prepared to give, nonetheless we're entitled to some more time. Now suppose a situation where, as here and as in many contracts, you have notice requirements in relation to relevant events. And the adjudicator in adjudication number one says there was no notice given, although in fact there was delay, the consequence of that is on a contractual basis that no extension of time should be granted. And he therefore refuses an extension of time up until the 18th of January. The contractor says he's wrong, notice was always given, and therefore he comes forward and says, um, in relation to the period after the 18th of January, well, you can ignore what the adjudicator said in adjudication number one, even though it was the reason for him refusing to give it, I'm entitled to reopen the question because it's a different period of time. In short, you get the opportunity not for saving cost and money, but for endless and prolonged disputes of form over substance. With that introduction, sorry, just one further piece of introduction, there have been particular problems in the decisions in a situation where, as is not uncommon the case, uncommonly the case, um, the adjudicator finds there has been a relevant event or something which in principle is a change. but then decides that sufficient proof has not been put forward of the consequences of that change. <clears throat> and what Mr Justice Stuart Smith's decision is, is an example of looking quite carefully at the decision to decide whether the decision was in fact that there should be no entitlement or whether the decision was that insufficient proof had been provided and that the um, claimant is still entitled under the relevant contractual provisions to provide different and further proof later on. Now the actual result in terms of the declaration 
or the award in either of those two adjudications is likely to be the same. I therefore award no extension of time in relation to the period to whatever it is. It's only by looking at the substance of what it is that is decided that you see that in one case you are precluded from coming back and the other you are not. And in my submission, that is precisely what was being discussed by Mr Justice Stuart Smith in Hitachi. Um, that is a case which uh, is to be found at tab 8 of the uh, authorities bundle. Yeah. <coughs> now, what had happened here is that um, there had been, as in this case, a series of adjudications uh, between the employer and the contractor. And what was being decided in uh, the case before Mr Justice Stuart Smith arose out of the eighth adjudication. And as you see from paragraph one of the judgment, um, one sees uh, that the judge summarise it uh, as being whether or the adjudicator has no jurisdiction because the same or substantially the same question has already been decided by an earlier adjudication, in, in this case the second adjudication. Now, the, the critical point in relation to this is um, in relation to uh, what was known as uh, event 1176. Yeah. And you see that from uh, how the judge rehearses the matter, paragraphs 15 and following. where you see in adjudication 8 that they made further attempts to recover monies for event 1176 in the sum of just under a million pounds. And it relied upon evidence that included much of what had been submitted in adjudication number 2, but also went well beyond it. Hitachi rejected the claim on 30th of November, asserting it had no contractual merit. And then that was... Um, referred to adjudication in accordance with what is set out at paragraph 16. And after dealing with uh, quite a lot of the history, Mr Justice Stuart Smith dealt with the applicable principles starting on page 130 at paragraph 24. And he deals first of all with the common principle that the adjudicator doesn't have jurisdiction to decide a dispute of the same or substantially the same that a dispute has already been decided. See paragraph 9, 2 of the scheme. Now, just pausing there, in my respectful submission, 9, 2 of the scheme is something of a red herring, and it is worth just analysing why this um, gives rise to problems. If one looks at the scheme at tab 13, you see in paragraph 1 the requirement to give written notice of intention to refer any dispute arising under the contract to adjudication. And in the early days of adjudication, and to an extent still now, one of the arguments which was used quite often to buy more time, but sometimes substantively, was to say no dispute has arisen, therefore you can't refer it to adjudication. A and um, the courts have dealt with that as to what is required in relation to the existence of a dispute. Dispute in that context is, in my submission, plainly whatever it is that's being referred to arbitration. Uh, to, to adjudication. It can be wide or it can be narrow. It could be the valuation of one particular variation. It could be a final account variation. It could be the valuation of an interim payment certificate. It could be the entitlement to an extension of time. Within that dispute, there may be many issues to be determined, a final account valuation. There may be only one. But it is a generic 
item which one looks at in item one. Paragraph nine deals with resignation. And nine two, an adjudicator must resign where the dispute is the same or substantially the same as one which has been previously which has previously been referred to adjudication and a decision has been taken in that adjudication. Now just focusing on resignation, <clears throat> plainly neither party in this case contends that Mr. Malloy ought to have resigned when adjudication number six was started. It was common ground between the parties that there were outstanding disputes relating in large part to section one and individual variations which had not been determined, which had been referred to him, and which it was his duty to decide. <clears throat> so no one is saying that that is directly applicable. The only way that it feeds into the analysis is saying that if it's not precisely the same dispute that has been referred, but it is extremely close, and inferentially in my submission, this must be the dispute which is referred to in paragraph one, then the adjudicator has to resign. Uh, and so the only way this can really be used is saying that there's an intention that even if there's a not precise parallel, if it's only substantially the same, then the adjudicator's got to resign. What this paragraph does not do is detract, if anything it adds, to the obligations which I've already shown you at paragraph 20, which is to decide the matters in dispute. And note there, matters in dispute, plural. And in my submission, we'll, we'll come back to this after we've dealt with Mr. Justice Stuart Smith's decision um, to, and look at Mr. Um, Anthony Edward Stewart's decision. How you decide the matters in dispute in relation to an adjudication, is you obviously first of all look at what was put to him, then you look at what it is that he's actually decided. And you approach it in either an identical or a very similar way to approaching the ratio of a court decision. And just to give a practical example, one of the cases which is before you is an earlier decision of Mrs. Justice O'Farrell in relation to Global Switch. She decided that adjudication number four had to be set aside in its entirety because the adjudicator had been persuaded by those instructing my learned friend uh, that they were entitled not to consider a defense on the basis it hadn't been the terms of the reference. She also made some other comments in relation to other grounds on which we sought to challenge the matters, which were plainly over. Her decision in that case, in accordance with conventional principles, was plainly that on which he was resting. And applying the matters to this case, the decision of Mr. Curtis in this case, referable to the only matters in dispute, <coughs> was as to contractual responsibility for the um, um, in installation and pulling of the cables. <coughs> so 20 means that you've got to decide the matters in dispute. And then 23.2 says the decision shall be binding on the parties and they shall comply with it. Now, my learned friend would like to say that only means that if he awards 170 days, you have to uh, accept 170 days. Or if he awards £226,225, you have to do that. In my submission, that is much too narrow. The decision is not merely that, it's what he actually decided. And so, reversing the matter, if he decided that there were no relevant events, we could not come back and say that those same relevant events justified an extension after the 18th of January, when that issue had been determined against us before in a decision. And in, in, in my submission, when one goes back to Quiet Field, which is where the same or substantially the same comes from, 
read properly, all that the same or substantially the same can be doing is slightly expanding the scope of paragraph 20. Can I just ask about that? I mean, the same or substantially the same comes from 9.2. It does. Um, which you say some, is something of a red herring. But it was my understanding, which may be imperfect, that it, 9.2 was the basis of the principle that an adjudicator couldn't decide something which had already been decided. In my submission, I, I would submit no, that actually properly analysed, it's 20, sorry, 20... Um, uh, because that's binding on the parties. Because the, dis the decision is binding on the parties. The trouble is that the parties don't listen. I'm not talking about the parties in this case. I'm talking parties generally to construction contracts. Um, and so it falls to the adjudicator to say effectively whether or not that's the same or substantially the same. Um, and so in this case... If you're right, Mr. Malloy should have resigned insofar as the disputes touched on adjudication, sorry, touched on uh, the question of the ductile. Well, um, Malloy, I, I put it. I don't know whether you can sever it. I've, I've never looked at whether you can sever a resignation. But do you see the point? Because otherwise, I. I, I completely understand. You're completely right about um, um, 23.2, and I get your submission um, that there's more to it than simply saying it's the bottom line. I, I get that completely. But I'm just putting myself in the shoes of an adjudicator. He or she knows that they can't decide something that has already been decided <clears throat> and why do they think that where does that come from well, well there's one other provision which I referred to but didn't show you in terms and it's, it's actually in a sense quite interesting if one goes to the actual act itself at tab 12 mm. um, little 3 little 3 of well, sorry section 108 little 3 oh yeah the contract shall provide in writing that the decision of the adjudicator is binding until the dispute is finally determined by legal proceedings, by arbitration, or by agreement. So that is saying what is a requirement of the scheme, the, the scheme. and as the scheme is made under uh, section 108, it has to be read in compliance with that. Now, um, that therefore means, in my submission, this. If it's binding, if the decision is binding, you work out what the decision is, and the only person who can then change that decision, the only person who's got jurisdiction to change that, is the arbitrator or the um, court, depending on what the dispute resolution provisions are. And so section 108.3 informs how you then deal with um, um, the, the, the scheme. Now, now, just coming back to my Lord's point, I, I fully accept that one way of reading this, an adjudicator must resign where the dispute is the same or substantially the same which one has been previously referred. You could say, well, he's got to resign in relation to that particular matter. My Lord, that, that would seem a strange way of dealing with it. A, a, a simpler way of dealing with it is to say that when... He's got to decide the matters in dispute, 20 of page 201. The matters in dispute can't include matters which have already been decided. And then when you look to 23.2, because the decision of the adjudicator is binding on the parties and they shall comply with it until the dispute is finally determined, insofar as a previous adjudication has decided um, the relevant matters, he hasn't got authority under matter to deal with. In my submission, that is a cleaner way through to the jurisdictional question. I suppose one way of looking at it might be to say that um, what Mr. Molloy did 
in effect in um, adjudication six um, was in paragraph 41 to say um, I'm bound um, and that in effect putting if you see it read it through the lens of 92 is effectively saying and to that extent I resign in relation to that discrete aspect of the dispute because what was referred to Mr Malloy was not just the one point but a more complicated dispute in, involving other issues. No, no, that's one way of reading it. I, I mean, it just occurred to me. Um, I, I, my lady will know, I'm sure, that, that the authorities do say that the adjudicator is required in this respect, as in other respects, yeah. to consider the scope of his own jurisdiction. Sure. Um, but, but of course he can't determine it. You've got to read all those provisions as a coherent whole. Absolutely. Uh, and if you put your route with this route, Effectively, that's what Mr. Malloy did. He said um, these issues have already been decided by um, in, in adjudication five, um, and and I'm bound by it. Yeah, absolutely, and, and as as in one of my five sentences, I said on that we we say he was absolutely right. We go yeah. off him when he comes to looking at the facts, but we're very keen on him so far as. Um, <laughs> but in, but in a way, if your if, if your point is right, doesn't his view of the facts doesn't matter. Yeah, absolutely irrelevant. No, it's completely irrelevant. Absolutely, my lady, and that—that is—that is, that is, our, that is our, our submission. And now, the, the only reason I'm really drawing on it—I I don't care, frankly, whether the test is the same or substantially the same, <laughs> because I say it's the same, and substantially the same helps me. I'm—I'm I'm on this point really just trying, but maybe not successfully, to help the court as to why it is that this has still been giving rise to some problems when one looks at it. And in particular, to help you as to how it is, I say the judge has gone wrong when we come to his reason. Um, I don't propose to say anything more about it um, for, for, for present purposes. I want to go back to what Mr. Justice Stuart Smith has said. Yeah. No, I think it's helpful to look at the because we all we all assume adjudicator two can't decide anything that or can't decide what has already <coughs> been decided in adjudication one. But it is actually worth looking to see where that comes from. And it, it, on any view, it, it, it arises in a slightly convoluted way because there's no provision of the scheme that says that. Instead, you've got the resignation provision and you've got the binding provisions absolutely. later in the scheme and, of course, in the Act itself. Uh, absolutely, my lord. And, and as, as, I've, as I've already said, it's really for that reason that I'm, I'm showing you those, to, to suggest why it is, well, for two reasons. One is to suggest why it is that it has given rise to difficulties. And particularly when I come back, as I will do pretty briefly, to look at Mr. Because I point. think it's probably fair that the Act um, um, and, and this, to a lesser extent the scheme probably assumed that this would only arise in limited circumstances where uh, somebody thought that, um, that effectively they would have another go and an adjudicator, that's not permissible, so the adjudicator would resign. I, I doubt whether Sir Michael Latham and um, those responsible for the original act had in mind that so popular would adjudication be that parties would be having eight or nine adjudications between them. Um, I'm sure Mr Nissen could do better, but my, <laughs> my record's 32 for what it's worth. 32, <laughs> yes. I have heard of, um, of, of uh, that, um, and I know that... Uh, uh, and And... Let's be fair, that does show that adjudication works. If it didn't, parties wouldn't be having 32 adjudications under the same contract. Um, so, so, you know, it's all good. It's just we, we need to be precise about what the limitations are and where they come from. <coughs> just, just, just on that particular point, I mean, you know, Bleak House, the, the sort of practice of English law is to um, is to generate work for itself. Now that's that's not directly applicable here, but it is the fact that if you had very, very large I mean this this by the standards of some of the contracts, it's a substantial contract, but it's not an enormous contract. Mm. You, we, you're not building a power station or, mm. or, 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 or something of that nature where you where, where you obviously almost are intended to have serial adjudication. What the Act is plainly aiming at in relation to a situation like this where bluntly, as the court can see, the parties do not get on. Mm. They plainly, for present purposes, feel very strongly that they've been let down. It's a yeah. situation where people are entitled to have a quick and, 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 and then, as it were, move on. And if they still can't agree with all the costs of um, it, 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 
um, instructing the no doubt very reasonable Mr. Nissen and so forth, then um, then they'll come and have it decided by um, um, have it decided by a judge. It's not the first time you've been wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, but 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 just but just coming back to the serial point. I mean, the, the, there are a whole series. People now will start dummy adjudications in order to get out of the way an adjudicator on a panel that they think um, um, might not be a table in order to have the one who, you know, there's all sorts of stuff which goes on in relation I, to this. I understand that. Uh, Just as you know, in the old days when official referees were on a rotor, that also used to happen. <laughs> and as, as, and I'm entitled to say that as the last official referee, <laughs> I could say that I. I I saw the little man from the solicitors who shall be nameless coming in to do just that. But the, the, the point I'm making is that obviously after um, more than 20 years <coughs> of adjudication, um, the court has now got experience. Uh, serial adjudications is still a problem in my submission. And I'm, I'm, I'm seeking, I, I hope helpfully, to explain or to explore some of the, some of the difficulties. Well, although it, it's right to say, again speaking personally, from the authorities that we've been shown, and other authorities of which I'm aware, it's very easy to understand why a particular decision went the way it did. Mm -hmm. um, um, there's, there are very, very few cases, either in the, the bundle that you prepared or, or, or the, the, that one is aware of, in which you look at that and you wrinkle your brow and you think, can that be right? Well, maybe that's a so. That, so, so again, it, 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 there's there's not a big stick that anybody's trying to beat the parties with that says serial adjudication. And as I say, on, on the authorities in general <coughs> terms, they seem they they seem sensible. The question, in effectively in this case, is which side of the line. Um, but but you were taking us to Hitachi. I, I, I wasn't. Um, well, could I could I start um, the the um, the judge runs through starting at page one hundred and thirty quiet field and so forth. I'm not going to go to quiet quiet, quiet field. Yeah. I'm going to pick it up where um, the judge looks at Korean, uh, which is at pa um, paragraph twenty nine on page one three two. Yeah. And this is a passage which is highlighted by my learned friend. Um, you may have not have got the colour coding, but um, yeah. red is me, blue is me. Uh, sorry, blue is my learned friend, and red and blue is both of us. Um, so, uh, Mr. Just Aiken had provided general guidance to the facts, amongst others, can be deployed in considering whether the same or substantially the same dispute has been resolved in an earlier adjudication. He tends to concentrate upon the ambit and scope of the disputed claims that have been referred rather than to what the first adjudication decided. For that reason, I respect to take the view that guidance he gave cannot be regarded as comprehensive, and if taken on its own, is capable of leading to error. And then what is emphasised is that um, what has to be looked at, and this is a passage from Lord Justice Jackson, one must look at what the first adjudicator actually decided. And we respectfully submit that is absolutely right. That is what you have to do. And I, what it's worth, as I understand it, in one sense, the dispute comes down to this. Did Mr. Curtis merely decide that we were entitled to an extension of time um, up until the 4th of January? Or did he decide that there were relevant events? And in my submission, on any view of the, deci the decision I've shown you, it is just a nonsense to suggest that all he said was that we were entitled to an extension of time up until the 4th of January and the period up until the 18th of January. And then at 31, um, subsequent Court of Appeal authorities <coughs> adopted and endorsed the approach of the Court of Appeal. Although the adjudicator's view of whether one dispute is the same or subtract the same as that has already been decided may be influential, it cannot bind the Court if the Court is asked to determine the issue. Um, and then he says, equally, the authorities have referred on occasion to analogies between this issue of stoppel. The applicable principles are not the same and may be liable to confuse if attempts are made to elide principles uh, that are relevant to the conduct of final litigation. This is not least because adjudication is, by its very nature, an interim procedure for the protecting and promoting of cash flow in the construction industry rather than a system of litigation designed to ensure finality from the outset. 
In my judgment, this provides a cogent reason why the inquiry in the context of adjudications should focus intently upon what the first adjudicator decided. And then he looked at the principles um, in the current case. And if you look at 33, he asked himself, what did the adjudicator in the second adjudication decide about event 1176? Now, prefacing what I'm going to say, what he therefore does is look intently at the reasoning and rationale in order to find out what it was that the adjudicator decided. And second, is the dispute that was referred to the adjudicator in the eighth adjudication the same or substantial dispute as the same dispute decided by the adjudicator in the second adjudication? And he then goes through at 35, answering his first question, which is what did the adjudicator in the second adjudication decide about event 1176? And if one, um, he identifies <coughs> the relevant passages, and the important point is that he's running through on page 134, uh, paragraph 11 of his decision, this is obviously paragraph of the 11 of the reasons, it's not paragraph 11 of the declarations, he identifies at 46 that detail fell short. In Appendix 1, he decided that 11.1.6 was a variation that required valuation. He put it in the category of cases where the evidence provided was insufficient to satisfy the requirements. He then said expressly he had insufficient details to value the works, and hence for the purposes of payment, my value is nil. And then his was his conclusion. The combined effect of these passages makes clear that the adjudicator expressly declined to take a view or make a decision about the proper value that could or should be attributed to 1176. His value of nil was not a valuation of the variation as such. The figure nil was merely the consequence or the lack of substantiation for him. It was not intended to express any view about whether, about decide whether CISC had incurred cost and expense for which they should be reimbursed in due course. So what he has therefore done is looked at the details of the decision and found, one, the adjudicators found that it was a variation. Two, essentially, there's insufficient substantiation. Not that he's looked at the detail and determined it to be nil. Um, and but for the, on the purposes of, for the purposes of this case, more importantly, isn't this right? He's decided that it, the uh, event one 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 seven six was part of the dispute referred to the adjudicator, Absolutely. but not decided. He said not decided by him because um, he said nil. Um, that was the consequences of the lack of substantiation. Yes, or another way of putting it is that he's decided only that it's a variation. He's decided that he can't award any sums to it because of the lack of substantiation. Yeah. So that, that's the extent of the decision. Yeah, but it, but, but the distinction is between what was referred and what was decided. Um, and it's for that reason, as I understood it, that he said that Mr Justice Aikenhead who concentrated on what was referred in the first adjudication, that guidance might be uh, capable of leading to error. It, it, yes, I mean, that's, that's the distinction he makes. Yeah. I mean, pl pl plainly, as other authorities um, make plain, obviously you look and see what's referred in order to see the context of what the dispute was and so forth that was being, being put forward. Yeah. But, I mean, an adjudicator can say yes, he can say no, or he can say not proven. <laughs> And, and um, subject to now, yeah. ju just this I think is unlikely to be contentious. Obviously, these decisions all need to be read against the particular contract which is being looked at. So you do get contracts which expressly allow you, in particular circumstances, to revisit decisions which are made before, and they have particular uh, context. I'm, I'm not going to go in that to that now, but just to make the obvious point that all of these are disputes which are arising under particular contractual frameworks which may have different provisions within them. Um, the, um, the, there is a, a, a difficult decision of um, what the building law report, uh, law reports incorrectly referred to as Mr Justice O'Farrell um, at, at tab 10, um, I, I may reserve what I have to say um, 
about that for reply. But th this is this is an earlier saga of the dispute between the present parties. Yeah. And and there is no doubt that her ratio for setting aside event number uh, adjudication number four was that the adjudicator wrongly failed to consider a defence which was open to them, and that was the grounds upon which um, she uh, set aside adjudication number four and refused to enforce the award. Uberta, she looked at another um, um, part of what we claimed was illegitimate trespassing on um, an earlier decision. Uh, and um, she dealt with this um, in particular uh, at um, ground three on page 172. And in my respectful submission, it is less than pollution. Sorry, I was noting something. Sorry, I was noting something else. Go back to which page? One seventy-two, paragraph seventy-two, my, my lord. Paragraph seventy-two. Yes, <coughs> this is a ground which is unquestionably, and it is accepted, Oberta, that she would have found against us if we hadn't succeeded on the earlier ground. Yes, you, you see what 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 the summary of that is at paragraph sixty-six. Sudlow's cases, the adjudicator wrongly came to decisions that contrary to the decisions of a previous adjudicator and thus exceeded his jurisdiction. And she refers to some of the authorities. But what exactly she's saying is, with respect to her, not entirely clear. At 72, she says, this is not a case in which the adjudicator trespassed on an earlier decision. But the decision in the second adjudication was solely concerned with determining Sudlow's entitlement to extension of time, extensions of time in respect of the main fit-out works. As part of that determination, Mr Curtis decided the additional strip-out works and the structural enhancement entitled Sudlow's to extension of time, but he didn't consider or adjudicate on Sudlow's entitlement loss or expense. Now, entitlement looks like liability. Um, it could refer to causation or loss. The first sentence of paragraph 73 then says, the decision in the fourth adjudication was concerned with the valuation of the works, variations and ascertainment of the values of loss and expense. So that certainly seems to be causation and loss. But then the second sentence, Mr Davies decided the valuation of the strip out works change was nil because those works fell within Sudlow's contractual allocation of risk. He also decided the instructions <coughs> regarding provisional sum items did not entitle Sudlow's to any extensions of time. However, he accept, expressly accepted it as binding uh, the earlier decisions. Now, just looking at that, um, it, those are, with respect to her leadership, very difficult. If they fell within the contractual allocation of risk, that appears to already have been decided, unless I suppose um, she's suggesting that there had been pricing in relation to it. And if one looks at the rest of paragraph 74, it, it, it's also um, unclear. Um, if you look at that, decided that the instructions regarding provisional sums did not entitle Sudlow's to any extension of time, etc. Now, in my submission, the court really can't get much out of this. My, my submission is that the correct approach is as follows. Just, just before that, who is the adjudicator in 74? Who is she referring to? Uh, that is referring to Mr. Davies, so that's the adjudicator in adjudication number four, not the earlier adjudication. Right. So it's the, for the present purposes, it's the, it's the subsequent uh, adjudication. But he said extensions of 292 days. <coughs> yes, it's definitely. So, it, it, I, I'm not it's, it's quite compressed. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I make three points about this. 
It's obiter. Um, we obviously said, I said, at the time it was wrong. Um, and, and it's actually quite difficult to see what it is that she's saying. For present purposes, my submission is this. If an adjudication decides the element of contractual risk, but nothing else, no valuation, it's not open to a subsequent adjudicator to change that determination. It is, of course, open to a subsequent adjudicator either to find, in the case of an extension of time, that um, there's in fact been no positive effect, or alternatively, in the case of a valuation of loss and expense, that it caused no additional um, cost. It, it, in my submission, it, it is quite difficult to go beyond that as a statement of principle. <coughs> and, and insofar as my learned friend relies on it, I, I'd rather suggest that a passage which is obitur in a decision which, by definition, we couldn't appeal. Um, because we won, um, it, it, it's not the most um, um, sat satisfactory part of it. Speaking for myself, Mr. Stewart, it was as clear as mud. <laughs> that was broadly speaking my 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 submission. And perhaps I wish that we'd drawn you if we'd lost on the other one, but there we are. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, now, well, let's, uh, with that, I propose to finish by going back very briefly to our skeleton argument in order to bring the threads together of where we say the judge... You, you, you mentioned, doubtless we've deflected you, you mentioned the, the cases that you, yeah, I think, said you were going to go to, Hitachi, which you've done, Global Switch, that you've done. Were you going to go I, to uh, Hida? I was going to go to Hida, I'm sorry. No, that's right. Um, um, no. Um, I'm glad I was concentrating. Uh, so which tab's that? Tab, tab five, my lord. Tab five, thank you. I've, speaking again for myself, I've only had a quick look at this. I know it's referred to, but... Um, um, uh, ju just to be clear, um, and, and to take, um, as it were, the, the sting out of the point, which I'm sure my learned friend um, will uh, make, um, that this is um, involving a slightly different question. What this was, was a dispute between a um, services subcontractor and a building contractor in relation to a complex fees dispute. And one of the elements of the fees related to, um, effectively, the, uh, what, what happens in relation to disallowed works. And there was a formula which dealt with that. So you're looking at, effectively, trying to work out what disallowed works is, how the formula is put together, and how much money Hydra as the consultant is entitled to from the building contractor in relation to a very large civil engineering project. So that's that's the context of all of this. Yep. And the, the complaint which is being made is a breach of natural justice. And the essential um, complaint is that the uh, adjudicator went off on a frolic of his own and without adequately referring matters to the parties, came up with a method which he didn't put to either of the parties and that led him into error. So it's it's a it's a it's of a different nature from what we've been looking at before. Um, however, in the context of that um, in the context of that dispute, if you go to um, paragraph eighty five at the bottom, he has a section of his judgment which is analysis of what the adjudication did or did not do. And he's analysing um, the uh, effect of the um, lack of opportunity to uh, uh, deal with particular points. Yes, you mean page 85, Mr. Stewart? Uh, I'm sorry. Not paragraph. Uh, yeah, I'm terribly sorry. Uh, page 85, absolutely. Paragraph 33. And, he starts off by saying that in order to analyse these submissions, it's important to establish precisely what the adjudicator did or did not do. Um, and he then refers to section 108.3 in paragraph 34, which we've looked at. Um, and then 35, um, he refers to uh, the fact that um, uh, reasons and defects and reasons aren't a good reason to set aside. <coughs> and then 36, he says this. Since it's the decision of the adjudicator that is binding on the parties, not his reasoning, 
one must consider what is meant by the decision of the adjudicator. In most cases, the adjudicator will determine that a sum of money is due from one party to the other, and the decision will therefore consist of a declaration that the particular sum is due, together with related declarations in relation to the amount of interest and question of costs. In that type of decision, it's clear beyond doubt the adjudicator's conclusion that X owes and has paid X pounds to B is binding until finally determined. However, suppose that the adjudicator's reason for deciding that the sum owed to B is X pounds is that he decided that B was entitled to an extension of time for Y weeks with a pro weekly prolongation cost of Z. In this situation, I find it difficult to see how it could be said the amount of the extension of time to which B was found to be entitled was not also part of the decision, and therefore not binding as between A and B, subject, of course, to B having the right to argue, etc. In my judgment, in that situation, the adjudicator's conclusion on the amount of the extension of time attributed to the state defence would also be binding on the parties. Accordingly, I consider that the adjudicator's decision consists of the actual award, i.e. that A is to pay X to B, and B, any other finding in relation to the rights of the parties that forms an essential component of or basis for that award. For example, in a decision concerning prolongation arising out of the amount of the extension of time to which the referring party was entitled in respect of those events. Now, it, my respectful submission, that um, passage is capable of being transferred from the context in which Mr. Justice um, Anthony Edward Stewart was putting it into the present one. And essentially, it is saying that you look for what we would call in the context of a court judgment the ratio of a decision, and those are binding on the parties. It's those, yeah. Happily, it's those two bits, namely the 36 and 38, and the frolic of its own, are the two points on which I cite Heide in the book. So, <laughs> uh, uh, on the face of it, I agree with you that those are the points to be extracted from Heide. Um, it's not a case, as you acknowledge, about the particular point we're on, but you say, uh, as, a, as a guide to what you're looking at, 36 to 38, as it were, is helpful. <coughs> um, can I then just um, go back to the skeleton argument, wherever you've managed to put it? Yeah. And just, can we um, put the authorities away? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm proposing now just to um, frankly finish off in relation to where the judge went wrong. Yeah. Now, if, you're, if, you, if the court could kindly go to paragraph 8 on page 434 of the bond. The key parts of the determination is, first of all, he said that the correct approach was to consider whether the dispute determined by Mr. Malloy was the same or substantially determined, uh, same as that determined by Mr. Curtis. And then his reasons was that although the existence or otherwise of the relevant events was an issue in both adjudications, this was insufficient to mean the dispute was the same or substantially so on three grounds. First, different periods of time. Second, dispute in relation to a new extension of time involved new relevant material and the event of testing, which wasn't and couldn't have been part of the dispute leading to the prior adjudication, and that the particular issue concerned only part of a much wider dispute between the parties as the contract works as a whole. Yeah. Now, what we say, and we say this arises in particular in relation to both little c and what he says in um, a, is the implicit assumption um, that there's only one dispute between the parties in each case which would be capable of an, which being binding on the adjudicator. In, in, in our assumption, this is, this is just plainly wrong. It will often be very sensible to have adjudications about particular matters, particularly in large disputes, which are at the core of disputes between the parties. And you may have several of those, or you may have several issues which are um, in dispute, you may have adjudications one to four, which are about different variations or um, different earlier extensions. You will then very often get a wrap-up um, adjudication, either on a final account or possibly on the last interim valuation, where 
it will, by definition, be a much wider dispute. But that can't possibly mean that the matters which have been decided earlier on and separately are no longer binding on the parties. Well, it may be a, a, a slightly academic point. I mean, you can only refer a dispute singular to adjudication. But fast track says that means a dispute means all the things that make up a dispute. So you can have a he said recollecting a 43 lever arch file final account claim referred to adjudication the dispute being what are we entitled to on the final account you, you can and the, the risk you do if you do that sort of very enormous one particularly if you haven't divided up before is the adjudicator may simply say I don't think this is suitable for adjudication I'm not accepting the appointment it hasn't happened yet I think it has happened, it's just that normally they don't get any repeat appointments. All right. Uh, that, I mean, <laughs> it, it's not a common occurrence. So, so um, I mean, to that extent, the judge is right, I think, to say it's a dispute singular because that's all you can refer. Um, your point is that, well, it's back to the essential component. Absolutely. Point. Yeah, it's, 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 it is. Um, but but what, what I am also saying, is that if you focus on what's actually been decided and say if it's been decided it can't be re-argued then, then C is actually irrelevant and wrong. Yeah. Um, now, they related to extension of time for different periods of time. That is, again, with respect, a complete nonsense in this case. If one asks fairly what was adjudication number four about? It is not... Adjudication number five. So, sorry. Five. Um, there have been so many. <laughs> <laughs> if you ask fairly what adjudication number five is about, you would say it is about responsibility for the events which it is common ground delayed the installation and the energisation of the HVB cable. No one was disputing that that had delayed the works. And similarly, that was exactly the same in adjudication number uh, six. <coughs> Obviously, you could have had a situation where a different and alternative event was said to have delayed adjudication number six. One can postulate all sorts of examples. But that was not the case. The essential dispute was exactly the same. It was since the contractual responsibility. And then, the new relevant material in the event of testing, which were not and couldn't have been part of the dispute leading to the prior adjudication. At best, this was further evidence, going different evidence, going to an issue which had already been determined. There were two more reports from RENA saying that we're right. It doesn't actually address the substance of the position. Actually, in the context of the overall dispute, we've got those RENA reports. They're pretty um, small, and um, unless your um, tan theaters are rather better than mine, um, they're, um, they're, rather, um, they're rather incomprehensible. But, but the, the, the short point in relation to them is that they are as relevant or irrelevant to the dispute as a whole as had already been determined. And what they are is an attempt to re-argue something which had already been made and lost. And if that is good enough, and it is the decision of Mr Justice Waxman is upheld, what you will find is that in commercial disputes such as this, people will lose, they will go away, they will go off to an expert and say, look, let's come up with something else and re-argue, reopen what's been put before, and we'll have another bite of the cherry in precisely the way that uh, Mr Justice Aikenhead uh, said was impermissible and you will go directly against the purpose of the Act and the underlying purpose of it. Well, it's based on a, a, a mischaracterisation of what was going on in Quietfield because in Quietfield um, you've got, first of all, the fact that the, the first adjudication in the series uh, didn't pan out the way that the party wanted it to because of lack of proof. So it's one of those types of cases. 
uh, and secondly, the dispute in relation to the second matter uh, involved a whole multitude of further evidence. But the fact that you've got more evidence doesn't mean that the dispute isn't the same. It's apples and pears. Uh, ab absolutely, my lady. You, 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 your leadership has, if I may say so, put it, um, put it much better than I do. <coughs> I, I'm, I'm conscious that I have already spent one hour and 50 minutes of the court's allocated um, three hours. Um, subject to any points which the court would like to raise with me, we, those are my submissions in relation to this appeal. Um, just uh, uh, two points, albeit one you may say, well, you'll deal with that in reply, but um, Mr Nissen has a contract point, um, which you haven't addressed. No, I haven't. Um, so is that because you'll deal with that in reply? I, I will deal with it. The difficulty with his contract point is, I mean, he, he, he hasn't got a, a respondent's notice, but in any event, it doesn't help him on a true analysis of the contract. It doesn't entitle him, having had the relevant events decided against him, to decide that you're going to have an entirely new point put forward. Uh, it's also not part of the judge's decision. OK, well, um, if there are points on that, um, you always have a right of, of reply. And the other point, just, th and this may come out of the detail, and I, I haven't spotted it uh, um, and, or understood it, and so it's my fault. But can you just help me with this? Um, in, the, in adjudication five, the relief being sought related to the delay, in adjudication six, there was a loss and expense claim related to that period, but we, we got a, we got we got the loss and expense relating to the extension of time which we had been granted up until but by in adjudication number um, five uh, number five. So let me just make a note. So Sadler's got loss and expense for EOT up to adjudication five. It, it, sorry, just to be just to just just to be plain. Obviously, um, on, on the primary case, uh, we got uh, loss and expense right the way through until. In other words, on 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 Mr. Um, uh, Malloy's original award, his his primary before nine hundred ninety six. We, we got we, we got we got loss and expense right the way through until um, the the effectively practical completion um, because uh, he found that he was bound. Um, on his alternative case, he still gave us lot of loss and expense up to the date awarded by uh, Mr. Curtis, namely December of uh, two thousand. Uh, but we didn't get loss and expense thereafter, and we were liable for liquidated masculine damages after the uh, extended date of completion. And liable for liquidated damages after January. Yes. Well, it, uh, uh, it's a little earlier because of the niggle. Okay. The, uh, and, and so it's the, just on the figures, the 1.1 million difference between the two awards, is that? Principally made up of it's, it's, you it's, not getting loss and expense for the second period and global getting liquidated damages for the second period. It, it is. It, 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 it's exactly I, what it is. I think there are a handful of small variations that t turn on the same point. All right, but, it, but principally, yes. If I we know. say broadly, correct. Then, uh, then so it's the, 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 my learned friend is right. There was because of the contractual responsibility point. There were, uh, but, but, but that's that's the overwhelming majority. Okay. Uh, then. Uh, this is all summarised in paragraph 34, Mr Justice Waxman's judgment. It's there. Okay, well I can look at that. So 34 of Waxman. I, I, to, make, to make the obvious point, when this wends its way through to the lucky TCC judge who um, has to determine this, um, if the position stays where it is, uh, there will be two different and completely logically inconsistent decisions as to the position where one is presently at. That's, yeah. That's, that's yes. Um, well, okay, well, that's, that's all I had. Shall we? Anything else?
No, thank you very much, Mr. Stewart. We don't have any more questions. Mr. Nissen. Uh, my lord, my ladies, <coughs> I start with uh, four introductory uh, headline <coughs> points. Uh, firstly, uh, whether a later adjudication uh, raises a dispute which is the same or substantially the same as an earlier one is a question of fact and degree. Uh, the citations for that are, are, are plenty, but Quiet Field, paragraph 47, Harding, uh, 53 and 56, Hitachi at 2, uh, and the other Court of Appeal case, Brown, at 20 and 21. It follows uh, in our submission that, save in an extreme case, this court should not affair, interfere with that fact and degree assessment by an, uh, uh, an experienced first instance judge. A, a matter of fact and degree is precisely that. Uh, it isn't a matter of law, respectfully, which warrants investigation on appeal. And presumably the same applies when the first instance judge is looking at a similar determination by an adjudicator. The uh, courts have, have clearly said that due deference must be given to the reasoning of the <coughs> adjudicator, but obviously when it becomes a matter for the court, ultimately it's a matter for uh, him or her to make that fact and degree assessment. But, but can the first instance judge just do it anyway, or does the first instance judge have to be persuaded that there's something wrong with the adjudicator's assessment? No, he does it. He or she does it anyway. I see. It's a, it's not an administrative law um, a position. The the, the, the the judge is dealing with the matter, um, paying due deference and regard to what the adjudicator did, which is what Mr. Justice Waxman did, and he deals with why he considers uh, Mr. Malloy. I mean, the only reason I ask that question is because I think the test that Mr. Justice Waxman applied was um, well, the decision of the adjudicator was clearly wrong. Yes, uh, he, he, as part of, that's, I, I suppose, simply a, a symptom of the emphasis with which and degree of conviction with which he held uh, the point. That wasn't the test that he needed to apply. I see. Uh, uh, I mean, you can tell I'm not familiar with this area. No, no, not at all. So, so that's not the judge applying the test that should be applied. It's just him saying, I think this is terrible. Uh, co correct. Okay. Um, but he does, he, he pays deference to what Mr. Malloy says, uh, but points out why uh, he considers that his decision on that point was wrong. The uh, second point is that the three features relied on by Mr. Justice Waxman to demonstrate that the dispute in adjudication six was not substantially the same as the one in adjudication <coughs> five uh, were substantively correct. Uh, those three points being, firstly, uh, there was significant, or in the words of the adjudicator, compelling new evidence which was not available to Mr. Curtis uh, and which necessarily could not have been obtained by Global Switch any earlier than it was. No, no doubt you'll uh, elaborate on why the um, question of further evidence has any bearing on what the nature of the dispute was. Uh, 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 absolutely. Um, uh, Compelling is the um, the quote of Mr. Malloy um, is at Core Bundle 15, uh, paragraph 361. The second uh, distinction uh, is that the period in time sought by the ex uh, in respect of the extension of time was uh, sequential and different. Uh, and then uh, Mr. Justice Waxman's third reason: at a broader level, the shape and content of the single dispute in adjudication five. Uh, was different from the shape and content of the single dispute in adjudication six. The third point uh, I make is that in determining the extent to which the later adjudication seeks to trespass on the earlier one, there are particular features of extensions of time claim which the court needs to take account of. Delay claims uh, and claims for extension of time have a particular feature, uh, which is that they rely on the development of a narrative of events. Uh, and lastly, um, uh, we submit that there's been a good deal of um, respect to scaremongering uh, as to what may happen if this appeal is allowed, uh, or not allowed, I'm sorry. Um, we submit as to that, that there is no concern. The principles are well established. Uh, parties are indeed 
conducting serial adjudications, uh, that uh, is a measure of its success, not its failure. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that in an ongoing project. Uh, as Lord Justice Dyson said in Quiet Field, paragraph 48, adjudicators will have little difficulty in deciding if two disputes are substantially the same uh, as a matter of generality. Uh, and the law has properly developed in accordance with the case law. Uh, however, uh, the nature of, of our particular case in relation to the new evidence upon which we rely means that uh, there are features of this case which are most unusual. And in that respect, uh, are the opposite of a floodgates case. <clears throat> I don't accept the uh, uh, proposition uh, that serial adjudications are in, them, in and of themselves contrary to the statutory scheme or the Act. Indeed, uh, I would submit they are perfectly in accordance with it. Well, it all depends what you mean by serial adjudications. Uh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. If it's if it's if if they relate to uh, different disputes in the same project, that's precisely uh, what 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 uh, the act envisaged. Uh, obviously, um, uh, the, the question is whether that is what we're dealing with here. So I'm going to deal with um, uh, essentially five uh, matters: the new evidence, the scope of the dispute and decision, the law. A general uh, submission uh, in relation to uh, paragraph 20 uh, and then some conclusions. Paragraph 20 of the scheme? Yes. Um, so, uh, firstly, the new evidence. Uh, <coughs> what is that uh, all about? Um, it, it's important to understand the context uh, of that new evidence. Let me just um, uh, uh, summarise it and then we'll go to some documents for which I'm apologise for some of the level of detail. The new evidence uh, was each of the fact of successful testing of the new cable, the fact of successful energisation of the new cable, and the fact of an absence of reported problems with, its installed, uh, with the in installed cable since. And those were uh, aspects of new evidence found by Mr. Justice Waxman uh, as a fact at paragraph 67 of his judgment uh, and identified by me at paragraphs 49 and 50. Maloney Friend, throughout uh, his uh, written argument and indeed today, has focused on the reports as he described them from RENA uh, and not on the factual event that the cables have continued to work in service uh, as evidence uh, that essentially our point was correct. He's focused on the documents and not on the historical development that the cables worked in practice. To see the impact of these matters, can I take you please to uh, Core Bundle 15, page 361, uh, at, uh, that's tab 15. Paragraphs 173 and 174. Uh, Global Switch make the point, uh, uh, and there's a distinction here which you will see in the documents that we're about to take you to, um, because the Mexican standoff, as it has been described today, is not quite in our submission. Accurately described. Global Switch makes the point that it was not asking subloads to take responsibility for the uh, power testing installation or to terminate or energize the cable, but merely to facilitate the termination and energize of the cable. Global Switch also makes the point that to the extent the characteristics were unknown, they could have been confirmed by testing, measurement, and calculations after termination as has now been done by the fourth and fifth RENA reports. These points are well made. In my view, the most compelling evidence regarding the adequacy of the duct installation by JMS and the cable installation by power testing 
is the successful energization of the cable on the 19th of August 2021 and the absence of reported problems since. So that uh, is the evidence uh, which was both new and substantively material uh, as found by the adjudicator to have happened, uh, which uh, uh, was upheld uh, by the uh, judge. Can I, um, uh, and of course, these events described in paragraphs 173 and 174 uh, happened uh, in uh, uh, August 2021 uh, uh, and onwards, which is after the period uh, with which Mr. Curtis was concerned. So uh, what the unusual feature here is that this was new evidence uh, which chronologically occurred after the period uh, of the Curtis decision, but which informed some of the prior history. Um, I'm going to, as I say, um, take, take you just to a handful of documents just to um, uh, uh, understand the context. So um, in the supplemental bundle, tab, four, uh, tab one, starting point in the history was the fourth, on the 4th of November 2019, Global Switch issued a project manager's instruction uh, which asked Sudlows uh, if, if the court would kindly look in the box headed description of instruction, asked Sudlows to remove the cable that's the one that was damaged uh, and then to arrange for the replacement of the new cable. That was the instruction. Uh, that was in uh, November 19. Uh, essentially, uh, Sudlow said they would remove the uh, damaged cable, but they would not take responsibility for the installation of the new cable. So the Mexican standoff, uh, which was in play at the start of window 29, start of window 29, with which Mr. Curtis was concerned, was uh, Sudlow saying they won't go to install the new cable. Uh, jumping ahead to tab four, uh, page uh, uh, nine, uh, we're now well within uh, window 29. Uh, what Sudlow's do, uh, what Global Switch say, um, there's a debate in, in, in this letter, the 24th of July, and I'm going to take it up at the bottom of the page. Your cooperation and assistance is required in order to undertake the HV cable works with another contractor. In other words, Global saying, well, if you're not going to install it, we want you to assist uh, in relation to uh, our dealing with this. Uh, and sets out at paragraphs numbered 1 to 10 a series of steps in, uh, which are required uh, uh, in order to take the matter forward. Uh, they involve um, sublows of one, two, three, uh, taking various actions, removing load from the switchboard, uh, opening HVD, uh, opening HVD, uh, and then at step four, an important step, allowing global switch uh, to access the switchboard to enable power testing to gland terminate and test the permanent HV cables. So pausing there, they're saying, Sudlows, we want you to do these preparatory steps to allow uh, uh, Global Switch's people, power testing, to uh, uh, terminate and test the HV cables. So that's step four. Then um, uh, uh, there's a step for you, Sudlows. Step five, ensure the cast of keys in the location. Then we want you, uh, we say uh, to uh, Sudlows, to uh, allow us to carry out step six and seven. Uh, and then we want you, uh, so, so uh, we are to terminate, test, and energize. Uh, and then uh, at steps eight, nine, and 10, we're asking Sudlows, once our cable has been installed, tested, and energized, to re-energize all the downstream equipment. So there's a, 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 a allocation of responsibility. Uh, 
uh, and then 10 uh, once energized to re-energize all downstream LV supplies. Uh, so that is what was being asked for. Uh, and uh, the Mexican standoff then um, uh, was this. On the 5th to the 9th of August, power testing installed the replacement cable. So this was in July, this letter was in July. Uh, power testing installed the replacement cable. Uh, the Mexican uh, uh, standoff, therefore, was not about, at this point, the installation, but about Sudlow's uh, refusal to facilitate the testing and energization of the cable to be undertaken by my client's contractor. So um, that is uh, the, the standoff. Um, Maloney Friend loosely describes the standoff as being about energization and the suggestion that what was happening was Sudlows were being asked to test and energize our cable. And that isn't what was going on. What was going on was we said we would do it, but we obviously need your assistance uh, to facilitate that testing and energization by uh, uh, us, and then we want you to continue with your package of work uh, by energizing your downstream equipment. So uh, that's the uh, uh, that's the context uh, uh, at that stage. Uh, on the 18th of Jan, this is the uh, 24th of July 2020. As I said, the testing uh, uh, the um, installation occurs in August uh, of 2020. Window. Um, 29 ends on the 18th of January 2021, uh, which is when the notice of adjudication number five is issued. Uh, therefore, the window 29 plus, as it's been called, begins on the 19th of January 2021. So what, what happened in January 2021? Uh, that was the end of uh, the, win the period for which the extension of time events were. I think, I think that's when we yeah, was there an event? No, there was no event. What, what no. happened? I'm so sorry. it's time slicing. It's a time slice. So we're in. A, we move from reality to a, another world. Yeah. Well. Um, so it's time slice. So it's got absolutely nothing to do with any events. Eighteenth uh, of yes. January, twenty twenty one. Well, 2021. Uh, well uh, not not quite respectfully. They, they issue their notice of adjudication on that. Oh, okay, fine, um, fine. That that was an event. Uh, but uh, in uh, terms of the works. Well, at this stage, we haven't reached practical completion, and so the entitlement to extension of time is dependent on the provision of a notice uh, okay, and a claim. All of that. So they have they have a, a right to have an extension of time based on uh, the position as it stood up to the date on which they chose to issue their notice of adjudication. Right. But you say testing occurred in August 2020. Uh, no, the installation of the cable was in on between the uh, 5th to the 9th of August 2020. Uh, the, uh, uh, what, what then happened uh, was uh, Curtis' decision was issued, as you've been told, the remaining work was then omitted from the contract, practical completion certified in June 2021. Uh, and then on the 18th of August 2021, uh, the testing uh, was done, um, uh, and that supplemental bundle 14 Uh, page 187, Supplemental Bundle, Tab 14, page 187. Yeah. So by now, just to be clear, what's happened uh, is uh, the, the works have reached practical completion. Uh, the assistance that we had sought from Sudlows in respect of facilitation of the testing and then energization of was a dead duck. They, they, they had not been prepared to do that. Uh, the, that work was therefore omitted. But that, on that omission was within the period covered by adjudication five. Uh, the you just looked at it, July 2020. Uh, so, that, no. so the first point in no. paragraph 173 of Mr. Malloy's decision 
he identifies two points that he says are well made. Yes. The first, um, not asking Sellers to take responsibility, but to facilitate the termina termination and energisation, that was covered by adjudication five. That, that request certainly started then, but it hadn't been fulfilled and was ongoing. Fine, but the, 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 the point is that um, the refusal on your client's case, the refusal to um, facilitate. facilitate. Yes, continued yeah. Uh, yeah. up to the point at which... Uh, and then there's the testing. Uh, yeah, so work, work, that work which would have included facilitation uh, was omitted from the contract on the 7th of June 2021. The practical completion was then certified um, uh, on that date. What then happened <coughs> now in 2021, so this is in the period after um, uh, long after the Curtis decision, uh, we are now in a position where um, sublays are off the scene uh, and uh, we're in a position to test and then energise our cable no. uh, ourselves. No. Uh, and uh, at page 187, one can see um, uh, the testing, uh, the executive summary is all I think I need to take you to. Uh, 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 testing of the new cable system is required uh, prior to connection to the local electricity network. In the second paragraph, testing was completed by high voltage systems on the 18th of August 2021. All tests were witnessed by RENA. So this isn't a matter of expert opinion. This is a, a matter of physical testing, uh, which is being done by testing specialists and is being recorded by RENA. Uh, and the conclusion was on the 18th of August that the cable can now be energised. So this was a step uh, that was only undertaken then. Uh, and having passed the testing, then the energisation itself took place. And the energisation takes place on the 19th of August, the following day. There's also some further calculations, I should say, in RENA 4, uh, which in the preceding tab, that's another set of, 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 of calculations which I need uh, tr trouble the court with, but they were part of the package of the testing calculations that were done before energisation could be undertaken. Uh, so on the 19th of August 2021, the energisation occurs, uh, and thereafter, no problems with the cable were experienced. Uh, and so that it was those uh, events uh, which uh, uh, led uh, Mr. Malloy to reach the conclusion that there was nothing wrong uh, with uh, the ductwork, uh, as he uh, says, uh, and the, the uh, cause must therefore, um, that was compelling evidence that the cause uh, of the original problem must have been uh, the selection or installation of the original cable by Sutherland's. But more significantly for the period of the decision that he had to read, that what was the standoff that um, meant that Sudlow's, on his finding, his alternative finding, were not entitled to time, uh, was their refusal, their unreasonable refusal, to facilitate global switch in uh, undertaking the testing uh, uh, and the calculations, the testing and the energisation at the time that they were being asked to do so. And the point here um, it is that uh, Sudley's argument before Malloy was, well, it's all very well doing your testing and energisation after the event, but that doesn't, that, that's not the problem that we faced at the time. We, we, couldn't, um, we couldn't know the unknowable. And Mr Malloy rejected that, in my submission rightly so, because he concluded uh, as had been our argument, uh, that had Sudlows done what we asked them to do back in July 2020, which was to assist us in energizing, testing and energizing the cable, they would have known then uh, and for all times thereafter that there was nothing wrong with the cable. Uh, uh, but they wouldn't. Nothing wrong with the duct. Uh, I'm sorry, nothing, well, nothing wrong with the new cable and nothing wrong with the duct, uh, uh, but there was nothing wrong with the new ductwork, which therefore would have enabled them 
to carry out their uh, work on the their remaining work on the downstream uh, energization of the remaining services. Yes, they, their, their position was that they didn't like the new cable that we had installed. That was the point. They didn't want to take responsibility for it, and we weren't asking them to take responsibility for it. Was the ductwork the same? The, the ductwork never changed. It's just that I, I thought it was a slip of the tongue. You mentioned new ductwork at one point. I'm sorry, I, a new I, cable. I, I just thought that was a mistake. It, it, it was indeed a slip of the tongue. Apologies. It's, just, it's a new cable. So, so um, just to um, up, um, identify the way we put our case um, before Mr. Malloy uh, uh, in our response in the adjudication, uh, in the supplemental bundle at tab 19, uh, page uh, 280. in our response to Mr. Malloy, we say at paragraph 550.1, Sudlow's had no justification and was therefore in default for refusing to facilitate the termination, testing, and energization, uh, refusing to facilitate the termination, testing, and energization of the energy cable by power testing, and then, and there's a missing word, not there, not proceeding to the remainder of the work. <coughs> so that was our uh, submission. Uh, and that's explained by Mr. Lawrence in uh, the evidence in this case, uh, which was before the court. Uh, if I can take your lordship and your ladyships to tab 25. Are, are we leaving the this document, the response? Uh, for, for, for the purposes of the chronology, yes, but I'm happy to. to, to because, uh, as you say, that, I mean, this is, you're taking us to this submission which is paragraph 550. Yes. Um, so that was a submission um, in an extremely long document. Yes. Um, which, uh, earlier on, um, seeks to rely on all of the material that had been provided to Mr. Curtis. Yeah, absolutely. Speaking personally, the optics of that are terrible. Well, uh, I, what a what a what a thing! I mean, the the, the it, it may be that ultimately it doesn't matter. Although, again, putting myself in the shoes of the adjudicator, one can't help feeling enormous sympathy for him. Um, but but if in fact it boiled down to the two points that Mr. Malloy was capable of um, summarising in two paragraphs. Um, Surely there should have been some attempt to focus. Well, the, the point was this obviously had a very long story to it, but the, uh, the but the long story, on one view, had been decided. Uh, well, if it was a question of the facilitation and the new evidence, then surely it would have been better just to say that. The the, the point was that the, what the new evidence did was to support in a, in a compelling way the whole debate that had happened before. It yes, was a because the, previ the, the previous reports from RENA had said there's nothing wrong with the ductwork. Well, the the testing showed there's nothing wrong with the ductwork. Uh, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't just there was nothing wrong with the ductwork. Well, I understand. It, 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 I mean, it, I'm the, the, the point was... Um, because Mr. Malloy himself wasn't primarily concerned with the duck. He was concerned with the question of whose responsibility uh, it was for the delays which were occurring at the time in the period with which he was concerned. Yes. And so on one view, therefore, the, the, all of those witness statements about the period with which he was not concerned must self-evidently have been irrelevant. No respect. Uh, well, they, they obviously, um, in the end, needed to be to, 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 to be there to explain the significance of the new evidence. What the new evidence did uh, was this wasn't there weren't expert reports. These were the results of testing and the factual event that the testing was successful and the the testing um, 
allowed energization to go ahead, and energization then resulted in the, in the satisfactory operation of the cable. It showed uh, that the uh, Mexican standoff, the responsibility of the Mexican standoff in the period which started in Curtis and continued in the period with which he was concerned was completely different. Uh, and uh, Mr. Malloy needed to know that this wasn't um, this this wasn't a, a, a new theory. This was the the, the point uh, that ha had always been our case, but obviously we were predicting into the future uh, then what would actually happen. But we now had, if you like, um, uh, 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 concrete evidence uh, that was compelling in, in the different result, uh, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But but the uh, uh, it was essential for Mr. Malloy to understand the significance of this new evidence against the backdrop of the debate <coughs> that happened hitherto. Uh, so uh, it, it really is uh, 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 of significance to what Mr. Malloy was doing. Um, uh, and uh, as Mr. Lawrence says in his witness statement, page 385, um, the uh, uh, well, it starts at 384, paragraph 43. Uh, in simple terms, Global Switch was asking for Sudlows to cooperate and assist with the following sequence of events. This is by reference to the letter. Uh, it was only uh, after 43.2, only after the HP cable had been tested by power testing, Sudlows was to take the steps at 5 and 6 and allow Global Switch to energise the cable. So, where are you reading from? I'm reading them from the bottom of 384. Four, uh, so it's tab 25. Oh, yeah, fine. And this is the evidence before the judge in the proceedings. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then he's explaining um, the context of um, uh, the uh, <coughs> RENA reports and, and what they show. Uh, and therefore, he, he says in 44, um, uh, the fourth RENA report and the fifth RENA report demonstrate what the testing at item 4 of the letter uh, uh, would have shown. Therefore, even with the alleged lack of knowledge that Sudlows had at the time it was being asked to comply with the request, it was unreasonable for Sudlows to refuse to comply with the request. The point being, they weren't being asked to undertake anything that created a risk for them. Um, and uh, we told them that we would be carrying out the testing. Uh, and this was a point which Mr. Malloy understood and agreed with. Mr. Curtis, in fact, had not understood this point at all. He had not understood. No, which Mr. Lawrence is very keen to re-argue further down the page. Yeah, uh, and, and, and he's, he's respectfully right. What, if you go back to the Curtis decision, he thought that the debate was only about us asking Sudlows uh, to install the energy cable, the, the new cable, um, not that we were asking them to facilitate us. So Mr. Curtis had not appreciated this distinction, which Mr. Malloy had, and the significance that it had in the context of uh, the uh, new evidence. Um, so uh, the point, uh, 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 therefore, we make uh, is this, um, that uh, it's untenable in our submission to say that this evidence is not new, as Mr. Hopkins, uh, I think, sought to argue. Uh, all of these things had not happened at the time of adjudication number five. <coughs> uh, they simply hadn't happened, and they hadn't happened. Well, the testing hadn't happened. It's testing, energization, and the fact of uh, there being no reported problems. Yeah. But none of those things had happened no. at the time Mr. Curtis was reaching his decision. Uh, uh, and therefore, um, in the eyes of the adjudicator, Mr. Malloy, that uh, evidence was new and substantively material. Uh, we know he thought that because in his alternative decision he, he reversed the conclusion. So it must be a matter for um, him uh, uh, in our submission that that is so. It's not a matter, uh, uh, but if, even if it were a matter for the courts, it's not in my submission a matter for this court to challenge the significance of that finding. Uh, there's a finding well, by... Everybody, everybody wants a bit, but not another bit. <laughs> um, 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 
Mr. Stewart says we can't, I can't now remember which way around it is, but uh, uh, none of you want to challenge the bits that you want to hang on to, and what, none of you wants us to decide things that... Uh, well, uh, no, it, 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 Mr. Malloy found as a fact that this evidence was new and compelling. Yeah, he thought if he was, he was wrong to find that he was bound by the um, first decision. No, the, the, if he was wrong, that would be relevant to the impact of that evidence. But he did nonetheless find it. Well, I understand that. But, um, but so what? Yeah. Uh, so what? If he was bound by the first decision, what he found... Yeah, yes, but, 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 but... I mean, surely you're not submitting to us that uh, it's possible um, to go behind a binding decision uh, of an adjudicator on the basis that you found some evidence that you couldn't have had before him um, uh, purely on the basis of fresh evidence, surely the answer to that is if you've got fresh evidence that shows that the adjudicator got it wrong, you put it into, in front, front of the court. With respect, no, no that, isn't the, that isn't the tenor of the authorities. What the, um, what the authorities show, and we'll come to them, is that the circumstances in which new evidence can be adduced are, are, are different in character. Um, uh, and there are cases in which new evidence can be um, adduced. Uh, and it all depends on the circumstances. The, the cases look at the circumstances, as we'll come to, uh, whether there's some culpability uh, arising out of the fact that the new evidence was not available at the time, uh, matters of that sort. So we'll deal with that in your third, your third area. In, indeed. The, the, there's nothing... The, these are all decisions being taken um, uh, on an ongoing project. So... Um, the narrative, if you like, is still unfolding. Was the, um, Mr. Mulroy asked to consider whether or not he had jurisdiction to um, look at this material on the basis of the principles that you're referring to now? Uh, he was. Uh, there was a jurisdictional debate um, before him, which he yeah. recognises in the in his decision. Um, uh, and but I'm inferring from the fact that he considered he was bound by the first, um, uh, sorry, the fifth adjudication, that he, that he didn't accept those documents. Uh, he didn't, um, he, he, he didn't, for the reasons that Mr Justice Waxman found, w was that he applied the wrong test. Uh, uh, what he did was focus on whether there was an issue in dispute in the fifth <coughs> adjudication, that there was an issue uh, in dispute that was, um, uh, uh, w which formed part of that adjudication, uh, and he concluded was, uh, therefore, um, um, uh, he, he was jurisdictionally precluded from making the decision that he otherwise would have made. So he did, he did indeed um, uh, consider all of this, but uh, as Mr Justice Waxham found, and we say uh, rightly, uh, he applied the wrong test. All right, Mr Lisson, um, the my lady, Lady Justice Andrews, has pointed out the clock is, um, as would befit, the I'm Royal so Court of Justice, ten minutes slow. <laughs> um, so um, fascinating though it's been, we're going to have to uh, pause there. <clears throat> and we'll, we'll come back at ten past two by your watches, um, um, not that clock. Yeah. Thanks very much. <laughs>